Record. There we go. Well, good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel, Quincy, California. Turn with me in your Bibles this morning to the book of 2 Timothy. We're going to be in chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, as we continue our series through the, the uh, pastoral epistles of the Apostle Paul. The theme of the pastoral epistles is church order. And the sub-theme for uh, 2 Timothy would be to hold fast. The key verse for uh, 2 Timothy is chapter 1, verse 13, where Paul says to this young pastor, he says, Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. And how many of you know we have that pattern of sound words? It's in our Bible. It's the Word of God. And we need to hold fast to the Word of God. Amen? Amen? Not let go of it. Not be strayed away from it. But to stay firm on it. Now starting in chapter 3, which we're going to begin this morning, Paul is now going to transition from the practical appeal which he has been making. Uh, he's mentioned that, that our Christian life ought to be that of a good soldier. It ought to be like a, an athlete who plays according to the rules. It, it, we ought to be like hard-working farmers. And now he transitions from that to the prophetic appeal. So now the Apostle Paul, led by the Holy Spirit, looks to the future. And what he sees are the last days, the final days of man's rebellion on earth. These are the days in which we are living today. We, you and I here today, are living in prophetic times called the last days. Make no mistake about it. Amen. We are here. The last days are upon us. Now, I've done this study before. As just a one-time study, and I've got the title for it on, on the slide for you. 18 roadsides of mankind in the last time. Amen? Yeah. 18 road signs of mankind in the last times. Paul gives us 18 specific signs. And what's a sign mean? Something's coming. Something's ahead. It's, you, you come up to a road and it's got that big red sign that says stop on it. That's a sign. It tells you something. Amen? Yes. Curve in the road. Slow down to 15, right? You better slow down or you'll be off the road. So Paul gives us 18 specific signs, signposts that will be true in the last times. And we're going to look at these this morning. We are right now living in the final days of the church on earth. These are prophetic times, and, and again, make no mistake about it. This time is the time of the culmination of man's rebellion on earth. Soon, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is going to return. He's returning for the church, for those who believe in Him. According to God's Word in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we will, and, and 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we will be caught up. We will be raptured from the earth to heaven. And then God will unleash his wrath upon this Christ-rejecting world. So Paul gives us 18 road signs of mankind in the last times to tell us where we are on the road. So if you're not already there, Turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Paul says know this. He wants Timothy to know this, and because God put this book in our Bibles, guess what? God wants us to know this as well, right? Amen. Know this. Know this. In the last days, perilous times will come. The word know is the Greek word gnosko, and, and it conveys the idea of progress in knowledge, to grow in knowledge. The situation that Paul is about to describe is a situation that was developing. 
And Paul wanted Timothy to realize, to progress in his understanding, his knowledge of this, namely the growing perilous times of mankind that would mark the last days. And God wants us to know these things too. They're called the last days. And, and, and that word or phrase, last days, comes from a, a root word that means steadfast. It means immovable. It means it's a fixed time. This speaks of a time that's not going to change. That will progress from bad to worse. And, and this is, by the way, so, so different than the theology that says the world will get better and better. Look around. It is not and it will not get better. Paul the Apostle speaks clear words of warning here that this time will come. Perilous times will come. In other words, it's a time that is fixed, immovable, perilous in its nature, and it is coming. And in fact, I would say that it is here presently. Now Paul will go on in detail in the next three verses to describe the exact nature, the character of men during this time. A time that he says is a perilous time. And, and that word perilous means it's going to be hard to bear, hard to take, it's going to be troublesome, it's going to be dangerous, and even savage. I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like a world on the upswing. But a world that is sliding closer and closer to depravity. In fact, that word perilous has within it the idea of going from a higher place to a lower place. And, and nothing could be more descriptive of our world today, and especially our country today, than this slide away from the God of the Bible, away from our Judeo-Christian foundation. And we're seeing the effects of this throughout our society today. Again, just read the news. We are a nation in decline. And the only real way to build back better is to repent of our sins and return to the God and Savior of the Bible, Jesus Christ. That's the real only way that we as a nation can build back better. Amen? Amen. We need to repent. We need to return to Christ. Now look at verses 2 through 4 as Paul presents to us 18 road signs of mankind in the last times. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, that's a lot of uns, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And everybody said, wow, <laughs> wow. In these verses, Paul begins to describe what the character of men will be like in these last days, days that he says are perilous times. And he gives us 18 different descriptions, 18 different signs that spell out the nature of fallen mankind during this time. And it's not a pretty picture, but it's a picture that closely resembles men in the very day and age in which we live. What began in the days of Paul and Timothy is coming to a completion, perhaps, perhaps in our own generation. So Paul gives us, again, 18, 18 signposts along the road to tell us where we are in relation to the last days. And the first sign that describes mankind, that is, by the way, anthropos, the Greek word anthropos is men and women. So men, you're just not like this all by yourself. We're all like this. The first sign that describes mankind in these last days is that, is that they will be lovers of themselves. It's a fact. 
That's what the words will be mean. The fact is that men and women will love themselves more than God, more than family, more than anyone or anything else. Self-love will be the first sign of the last times. Abortion may be the leading example of this self-love. It's completely unnatural for a woman not to love her children. I've known moms whose children were complete reprobates, and they still loved them. I could never figure it out, but they still loved them. But in the last days, the love of self has taken over for a mother's God-given love for her children. And so children are murdered. Oh, I didn't mean to say murdered, did I? I did. Children are murdered in their mother's wombs so that the child will not be a burden or an inconvenience. That's what abortion is. It's murder. I've said it publicly. I've said it on video. And I hope somebody hears it. Abortion is murder. Amen. This is not only an example of the depth of sin in these last days, but the depth of the sin of self-love. That's how far self-love will go. Another example of self-love we see in this country is our infatuation with our own bodies. We are so in love with ourselves that we pamper and build and modify our bodies at the expense of everyone and everything else. Now, exercise in his... Not some of you. I've seen you. No. <laughs> and I told myself, just in that second, I said, don't say that. It's not in the notes. <laughs> now, exercise in its proper priority and balance is not necessarily wrong. But exercise at the expense of friends, family, and especially God is just an expression of self-love. You know, you can't watch TV today without seeing an ad for some new gadget being used by people who are in better shape than most of us have ever been. <laughs> and they want to sell us that gadget with the hope that we'll look like that. This infatuation with ourselves, our bodies, at the expense of everything else is self-love. You know, they rise up early. You see the commercials. They rise up early in the morning to get on the bike or the, the machine or whatever. They rise up early to do all that, but they don't rise up early to pray. It's self-love. Now, second, mankind will be lovers of money. Greed will be another sign of the last days. Now, men and women uh, will love themselves, but they will also love money. And, and these will be driving forces, driving forces, uh, markers on the prophetic highway telling us the end of the road is near. Now, man has always been greedy, but in the end times, it will become an infatuation. One of the things that occurs to me that, that today, Many young couples, and, and forgive me if that's you, but many co young couples don't want to have children because it will Id adversely impact their career. It will adversely impact their ability to earn money. They're lovers of money more than lovers of God, more than lovers of family, and it's a sad state that we're in. Amen. That husbands and wives don't even want to have children because you know, it, it'll impact their money supply. Thirdly, mankind will be boasters. And, and this word means empty pretender. Not only does mankind love itself, but it thinks more about itself than it's true. Have you ever for one moment watched the boasting that goes on in professional sports? What a lack of humility. In fact, humility is getting to be a rare commodity. In fact, humility among athletes would be a newsworthy item because it's so rare. Fourthly, mankind will be proud. This is the Greek word, a huberfanos, and it means to shine above. That's what pride is, to shine above. And, and I can't help but think how dark our light is. 
How dark our actual shininess is when compared to the true light of the world, Jesus Christ. You know, pride was the sin that sank Satan. And it will be the sin that sinks us if we think too highly of ourselves. The Bible says that pride goeth before a fall. Amen? Amen? I don't know about you, but every time I started thinking I was all that, I was on the ground. <laughs> Isn't it interesting that the world sees low self-esteem as it's one of its major issues, especially among youth, when all along it's not low self-esteem that's the problem, but pride. It's exact opposite. We think too highly of ourselves. That's the real problem. And sometimes, you know, we think too highly of our, oh, I shouldn't be in this situation, this place, uh, etc., because, you know, I should be here, not here. We just need to get a reality check, amen? amen. And think rightly of ourselves and not think too highly of ourselves. Fifthly, mankind will be marked by being blasphemers. This word comes from, from two uh, Greek words in your New Testament. The word blapto, uh, which means to hurt, and the word feme, which means to say. Uh, these are hurtful sayings, evil speaking. Some seems like people won't care what they say or who they hurt today. Self-lovers don't care who they hurt. In fact, it may make them feel good, feel satisfied when they're able to damage others uh, because it makes them feel like they're better than others. And, and today, today we are hearing the most outrageous words spoken publicly from politicians, news commentators, and even those who are educating our children. One teacher recently, just this last week, there was a news report. One teacher recently told kids that were in a, a conservative uh, uh, school club, she told them that they should just go jump off a bridge. In, in, and I know it sounds kind of funny, but in other words, what she's saying is just go kill yourself. You're not worth living. That's, that's hurtful speech. That's evil speaking. That's blasphemers. The sixth character trait of mankind in the last days will be that children are disobedient to parents. Since the 60s, youth rebellion has been growing in this country and around the world. Children have no respect for their parents, no respect for adults. An article in yesterday's news reported that kids at a school were protesting. And they began to throw things. They began to spit on and even assault the police. Where did they get this? Well, they see it on the news in Portland and Seattle and Kenosha and Milwaukee and almost every major city in our country. These are signposts on the end times highway. We should be looking at these and expecting the road to end around the next corner. For the Christian, they herald the coming rapture of the church, but for the world, they herald the tribulation, the coming wrath of God. The seventh signpost is that mankind will be unthankful. And this is the Greek word akaristos. It means without grace. Whenever you put an A uh, in the Greek language, and, and the Greek doesn't have an A, but in English as we transliterate it, uh, put an A before a word, it's like saying not this, not that. So this is without grace. This is not grace. It's unthankful. Gifts today are now considered rights. Mankind doesn't say thank you anymore for what they believe is rightfully theirs. How many of you have seen the growing trend among brides-to-be demanding that wedding guests pay for their wedding? Demanding that wedding guests even pay for their honeymoon? It's outrageous. It's outrageous. And, and thankfully, it's still considered bad taste today, but that's changing. The eighth signpost is that mankind will be unholy. This speaks of a condition of wickedness. It's the opposite of holy. Uh, that is, uh, the word holy means to be set apart for God. So a character of mankind in the last days is a condition of living in such a way 
then God is not honored at all. Self is honored. Self is promoted. Self is glorified. Self is all in all. And this leads to wickedness, unholiness. In verse 3, we see the ninth signpost, unloving. And this is the Greek word again, astorgos. Storge is the Greek word for family love. Astorge is you got no family love. No family love. No natural affection. There's so much talk today about the inhumanity of man toward man. And this is exactly the condition that Paul said would characterize the last days. A condition that lacks natural affection, lacks natural love. It is unnatural inhumanity that marks these days in which we live. And it's getting worse. We see this in the riots in our cities. The absolute disregard for other people's property and business. The violence in communities across this nation. The drive-by shootings. The intolerance for everyone and every institution and for every viewpoint we don't agree with. People are unloving across this nation and across this world. Tenth on the list is unforgiving. The King James Version renders this as truce breakers. It's not unusual. In fact, it is guaranteed that there are some nations in this world that in all cases will break any truce that they've agreed to. In fact, Muslim law commands Muslims to lie to the infidels. That, that's every non-Muslim. So they're literally commanded to lie. They're a whole religion of truce breakers. What well, seems as if no one can keep their promises today. Used to be, your word and a handshake was good. Today, you, gotta, you better get that in writing. Amen? Amen? And even then, it doesn't seem good anymore. The 11th signpost is that men will be slanderers. And this comes from the same Greek word for the devil. It's the Greek word diablos. And it means false accuser. This verse could read that mankind will be just like the devil in the last days. Falsely accusing one another. And boy, just, again, just read the news. False accusations flying left and right almost every day. Tw the twelfth item on the list is that mankind will be without self-control. The King James Version renders this as incontinent. And I'm going to try not to say anything more about that. <laughs> I'll leave that to your own imagination. In other words, they'll have no power, no ability to control themselves. They say and do what pleases them regardless of how it affects others. Mankind, you see, will have no restraint in the last days. They'll have no filter because they don't have that Judeo-Christian ethic and background, you see. And because of that, they have no filter. They don't have the Holy Spirit. They're not born again. They don't have God telling them, don't say that. <laughs> now, 13th on the highway to the end is that mankind will be brutal. They will behave like savages, like untamed animals. They will be fierce. You get the sense that like a brute beast, they will, as the old English used to say, ask no quarter and give no quarter. In other words, they will not show mercy to anyone. In business, they go for the kill on their competitors. In sports, they purposely injure one another. And we've seen that in some of our major sports. We've seen it in hockey. We've even seen it in football recently. And in life, they murder one another, even their own, and innocent people with drive-by shootings and mayhem. Mankind is not getting better. I wish that they were. I wish we could report things are rosy. Things are looking up. But mankind is not getting better. They're getting more and more brutal with each 
passing year. Again, once you, once you cut the anchor to your Judeo-Christian foundation, now anything goes. Anything goes. You no longer have anything to guide you, to lead you. And that's where mankind is at today in our nation. Now the 14th road sign is that mankind will be despisers of good. The world will hate and despise good. And it will hate and despise you when you stand up for what is good, for what is right. Because it is not doing right in the sight of the Lord. The Bible says in both Deuteronomy 12, uh, 8 and Judges 17 uh, and, and chapter 21, it says that men in their day did only that which was right in their own sight. In other words, they didn't do what the Lord said was right, but what they determined to be right. And conversely, we see that these same people then despise good. And they despise those who do good. In fact, they call us do-gooders. As if doing good were a bad thing, right? Oh, you're just a do-gooder. What, what? Doing good's good? No, doing good's bad today. They call evil good, and they call good evil. Have you seen it? I know you have. The world is upside down, backwards in its thinking. They're not woke, but they're lulled to sleep by the devil to do his will. I saw a newscast one evening several years ago showing marches and demonstrations in San Francisco over the results of the election. Christians were being blamed for turning the tide against liberalism. They spoke as if right was wrong and wrong was right. It was uncanny how they despised the good and embraced the evil Calling the evil abortions, homosexual marriage, stem cell research, calling that good. That's another good indicator, another signpost of how near the coming of Christ is. Starting in verse 4, we see the 15th road sign of the last days. That mankind will be marked by being traitors. The Greek word, uh, words that make up this uh, word mean to give something before. That is, before giving God what is right, mankind betrays its creator, instead worships creation. And no doubt Paul is also speaking here about false teachers, which he's spoken about previously in this book. They would at least be included in this. You can easily link this trait to them. They have betrayed the Lord, betrayed his word. Next in 16th, this is a long chapter, huh? We're only five verses in. Next and 16th on the list is headstrong. This is better translated in the King James Version as heady. Heady. It means that their heads are so swelled that their body tips over and falls head first downward. Isn't that a picture? It's almost like a cartoon. They think so highly of themselves, and yet that will be their downfall, you see. Next to last and 17th on the list of road signs is the word haughty. And, and this is an interesting word used here. It's not an adjective, but it's a verb. And the, the tense in the Greek language of this word means that it is done to them. You see, because of all these things, they become haughty. They can't escape it. They will be haughty because they've rejected the Lord. That's just what it means. The King James Version translates this word as high-minded. Another translates this as puffed up. And another as swollen with pride. The word itself means to raise up a smoke. To raise up a smoke. They're just blowing smoke. They're haughty. Last on the list. We're getting to the end of the road here. Last on the list. And 18th on the last day's road map is that mankind will be marked as lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. So the pursuit of pleasure becomes a God in the last days. It's the Greek word philodonus. 
It's a combination of two words, philo, which is uh, a love, one of the Greek words for love, in fact, brotherly love. And the other Greek word is hedone, meaning pleasure or lust. And, and we get the English word hedonist from this Greek word hedone. So the last days are marked by a contrast between loving God, who is the creator, and loving self, loving pleasure, which is loving the creature. And nothing could be more indicative of this generation than this particular condition. Even in many churches and among so-called believers, we see that a pursuit of pleasure outweighs a love for the Lord. You know, if we were to honestly rank our activities in terms of time spent or priority, where would the Lord fall in all that? Amen? Where would the Lord fall? We'd have to ask ourselves that same question. In verse 5, Paul says this. He says, having a form of godliness, but denying its power, and from such turn away. So in one sense, Paul's not only addressing the whole world, but he's addressing those who claim to somehow have some affiliation with God. They have a form, you see, of godliness. But they deny its power. They go to church, but they don't know Jesus, you see. They have a form. We go through the motions. We take communion. We baptize our children. We uh, dress up on Sunday. We show up. They have a form. We go through the liturgy. We walk the steps of the cross. We put ashes on our forehead for Lent. We have a form of godliness. But denying its power. The power of godliness is that Jesus Christ has died for our sins. And we receive him and his work as 100% sufficient for our sins. Amen? It's not in any form. It's not, you're not saved because you come to church. Amen? Amen. You're not saved because you read your Bible. You're not saved because you, uh, you say a prayer. You're saved because you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You see? That's the power. The power is in the cross of Christ. And the cross declares to all mankind, you cannot save yourself. On your best day, in your best suit of clothes, in your best frame of mind, you're a wicked sinner. <laughs> That's what the cross declares to us. The cross declares to us that there was no other way. Jesus himself in the Garden of Gethsemane, on his knees before the Father, said, Father, if it's possible, take this cup from me. Guess what? It wasn't possible that, that there was any other way to save mankind but that the Son of God himself would suffer and die for mankind on the cross. The cross declares to us that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son that whosoever believes on him and his sacrifice for our sins would have everlasting life, you see? Having a form of godliness in the last days, having a shape, a shadow, but not the substance, not the real thing. And I pray that each and every one of you here today has a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That you've bowed your knees before him, surrendered your life to him, let go of the steering wheel, and let God drive the car of your life. Amen? Amen. And I'm telling you, that's hard for me. I like to drive. <laughs> I like to be in the driver's seat. But as far as the Lord's concerned, I, I need to let go and let God. And so do you. So Paul has a clear word for us this morning. Clear word. So what are we, the church, to do? In these last days, as the world around us is rushing toward judgment, what are we to do as we see our nation and our society descend into chaos, descend into confusion? And believe me, I mean, we may see a few cycles, good, bad, good, bad. One step forward, two steps back, all of that. But ultimately, the world is rushing toward judgment. 
And it may, ver I mean, you, you read the news like I do, you keep thinking, how can it get any worse than this, right? Well, it will. It will. So what are we to do? Well, first and foremost, and, and I talked to the men down in Reno about this uh, yesterday, uh, right out of the, the book of the prophet Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 4, where it says, but the just shall live by his faith. So first and foremost, we who believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and as our Savior, we need to walk by faith. Amen? The Bible says to walk by faith, not by sight. We need to walk by faith. We need to trust the Lord in all and every situation that we encounter. Amen? Every trial, every difficulty, as our society around us descends into chaos and confusion, we who believe shouldn't be fearful. We shouldn't be worried. We shouldn't be stressed. We should look up for our redemption draws near. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is coming back. And he's coming back for those who believe. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 1.10, it says, Jesus delivers us from the wrath to come. Amen. There's coming a wrath of God upon this Christ-rejecting world. And Jesus delivers us from that wrath. He also says that we have not been appointed to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. The unbelieving world, they're appointed to wrath. They don't have to be. All they have to do is receive the gift of Christ, God's only Son, and they will receive eternal life. Amen? Amen. They don't have to be appointed to wrath. So the other thing that we, the church, need to do is we need to do what Jesus told us to do in Mark 14, 15. He said, go. And what part of go don't we understand? Probably that first word. <laughs> go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. There's a lot of creatures around you, at the grocery store, at your job, your school, your neighborhood, a lot of different creatures. <laughs> Go and tell them that Jesus loves them. Preach the good news of Jesus Christ, amen? So we walk by faith in these last days and we tell others about the wonderful Lord and Savior whom we serve. Let's pray. We'll have the worship team come back up at this time. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this wonderful, wonderful section of Scripture. Thank you that you have revealed these things to us. And thank you, Lord, that, that you've revealed them in advance so that we can take comfort we know, Lord, how near your coming is. We know that we are living in the last days. We know that you will soon return for your church. And so, Lord, we take great comfort knowing that even though around us everything seems to be descending into chaos and confusion, but, Lord, our lives are hidden with Christ. And we will one day be with you forever. So, Lord, I pray that you will so encourage and strengthen your church by this word today. And that you will equip us, fill us, enable us, Lord, to be good witnesses for Jesus Christ, to share your light with others. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Well, we'll sing one final song, reminding ourselves that though things are bad now, he's coming back. What a glorious day we look forward to. So, uh, Kyle, we're going to sing, uh, we'll go back and we'll sing uh, Glorious Day. We kind of skipped that one earlier. We're going to sing it now. <clears throat> one day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. The Word became flesh and the light shined upon us, his glory revealed. Living he loved 
dying, he saved me. Mary, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. Well, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Happy Thanksgiving. Amen? Amen. Amen. How many of you are going to be here uh, Wednesday night for Wednesday night service? Show hands. All right, I'll be here then. All right. All right. God bless you. Have a great week.